Welcome to the 18th Sunday in Pentecost. Shush, quiet, listen in this worship and during this week. Will you hear God in the pulse of your heartbeat? In the breathing of your coworkers, in the silence of the spoken message, in the words of the scripture, in the morning headlines, in the most recent athletic event, in the latest senseless killing, in the playfulness of children, whatever their age, in the confrontation of an unhealthy behavior, in the plaintive cries of the world around you, in the offerings of the rich and of the poor. We are We reach a point in our service this morning where we lift up our joys and concerns to the Lord and we share those joys and concerns with our fellow worshipers this morning. So let us pray, shall we? Teacher, liberator, and savior, we are in awe of your glorious presence. Your holy wisdom revives and enlightens us. Your vast power releases slaves from captivity and makes mountains smoke. Your salvation comes in knowing Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. Redeemer God, forgive our failings and our sins, committed both knowingly and unknowingly. May we not be ruled by sin, and may it have no power over us. Raise us from wrongdoing that we may share in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, Beverly Wicks will read our scripture this morning, the Old Testament found on the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, uh, and the gospel reading will be from Mark 12. Beverly? From the Old Testament, the book of Exodus 20, verses 1 through 4, and then 7 through 9. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you will labor and do all of your work. And then from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 35 through 44. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking of the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? And the large crowd listened to him with delight. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be uh, gathered and greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and in the places of honor at banquets. They devour our widows' houses, and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich rich people threw in large amounts of, of money, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. And calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. 
They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now when Moses descended from the heights of Mount Sinai, he juggled in his arms not two, but three tablets, each containing five commandments. I bet you didn't know that, did you? This is going to be an education. Now at least that's the way Mel Brooks tells it in his classic comedy, History of the World, Part One. Hear me, oh, hear me. All pay heed, the movie Moses proclaims. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15, oops, these, uh, these 10 commandments for all to obey. If you remember the movie at that point, the, the, the movie Moses drops one of the tablets and it breaks in a million pieces. Of course, as you know, it never really happened that way. But, but what if it had? What if it had? Think about that. What if God had originally meant to give us 15 commandments and five of those got lost? What would the lost five commandments, the other five commandments, be? We can all wonder what was on that lost tablet, and we can nominate whatever five commandments we'd like to add to God's perfect ten. So this can be a very personal list. I think those lost five commandments had something to do with con condemning the human compulsion to create piles. <laughs> piles. Now, when I was a kid, fall meant football, right? It meant fuzzy sweaters. It meant jumping head first and at full speed into a huge pile of, of freshly raked leaves. And, and as you know, nothing smells more like fall than this gigantic pile of multicolored fall leaves. I just love that aroma. Now, other piles are not so worthy or rewarding, are they? Our culture of too much is never enough believes in piling it up, no matter what the cost of people to the environment or to our souls, piling it up. In today's gospel reading, Jesus specifically warns all his disciples about the inherent dangers of piling. Now, the scribes, he condemns, parade around full of false piety. Instead of working to examine and explain the daily importance of the Torah for pious, observant Jews, these scribes were all about the walk and nothing at all about the talk. From flowing robes, extra long and elegant prayer shawls made from the finest linens and having the lengthiest corner fringes, to the places of honor they occupied at public events and in the synagogue. These religious bureaucrats were all about the flash and the cash. Now the truth and practice of the Torah was buried far beneath anything else that they piled up. When Jesus denounced the ostentatious behavior of these scribes, he was not denouncing a behavior unique to first century Judaism. Instead, he was exposing a common shallowness and self-centeredness that pervades everywhere among all people. And the urge to splurge on piles is stronger than ever today in our consumer, commercial, and celebrity-centered culture. Now, maybe it's time to reconstruct those lost five commandments as five thou shalt not piles. So perhaps the 11th commandment would be something like this, thou shalt not pile up. Now the scribes Jesus accuses of devouring widows' houses were actually piling up, taking advantage of those who are the weakest and the most vulnerable to add to their own already considerable wealth and status. I'm sure none of us can think of any 21st century examples of this type of behavior, can we? But like CEOs who bail out with that golden parachute while hundreds of employees lose their jobs, or perhaps international investors who reap huge profits in other countries without concern for the lives of the cheap laborers they exploit. 
No matter how many earthly treasures we pile up, it never seems to be enough, does it? How many who have wealth ever really feel that it's enough and that they can relax in true contentment? Only the poor widow in today's text seems to be immune to the urge of piling up what she has. Her faith is not in anything she has or doesn't have. She gives away the tiny amount she does possess because it does not possess her. Her faith is being stockpiled in heaven, not on earth. Thou shalt not pile up. The twelfth commandment, perhaps, would read, Thou shalt not pile on. Now, it used to be we were taught, don't kick somebody when they're down, or in other words, don't pile on. Whether a person was disgraced, was downtrodden, or just plain unattractive, piling on condemnation and accusation was considered to be bad manners, poor sportsmanship, and just plain unchristian. Now spend a moment to check, uh, in the checkout line of the grocery store reading the headlines of the gossip rags. Do any of you look at those headlines when you're waiting in the checkout line? I must admit I do. I'm curious. I'm prurient. I probably shouldn't, but I do. Or if you dare, perhaps go on the Yahoo website and look at the reader's comments about what the website calls news items. Wow, how times have changed. Now, piling on is now a national pastime. Whether it's a Hollywood celebrity, a political figure, a sports star who stumbles and falls from grace, we just can't wait to add our own jeers and judgments to the public insults, can we? Few things are more sickening today than these pile-ons. For example, doesn't it disgust you as much as it does me when the outcome of a football game between two unequally matched teams, the outcome becomes 77 to nothing? 77 to nothing. Did they really have to pile on the points to this degree. We used to give people the benefit of the doubt. Now we give them a kick in the stomach while they're being piled on. You see, the moment Jesus arrived at the temple in Jerusalem and began teaching, he was piled on by the Sanhedrin. That good old boys club of Sadducees, scribes, and Pharisees each took aim at Jesus and piled on their accusations. They had no interest in anything Jesus was teaching. They hounded him with questions only with the hope of tripping him up, pulling him down and piling on in a public fall. Jesus foiled their plan by never failing to answer them in unexpected ways. The Sanhedrin, the good old boys, couldn't argue with his answers, could they? But Jesus himself never took advantage when he bested his challengers. He never piled on after making his point. Now when Jesus was confronted with the life and death situation of the woman accused of adultery, he not only refused to pile on his words, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, caused those who were warming up their pitching arms to kind of slink off. Thou shalt not pile on. The 13th commandment, Maybe something like this. Thou shalt not pile in. Thou shalt not pile in. There's an old expression, piling in the bandwagon, or perhaps jumping on the bandwagon. We're all familiar with that one. A lively, noisy, attention-grabbing bandwagon drew people to it, encouraging everyone to pile in with the crowd, no matter what kind of music was playing. After all, if everyone else was climbing aboard, it had to be a good idea, didn't it? Now, the old-fashioned bandwagon continues today with daily reports of what is electronically trending or what's being tweeted. We happily pile in and go along for the ride whenever the wave of public opinion is heading. We humans can be such lemmings, can't we? Just look at the power of fashion in our lives. Or remember Candid Camera. Remember the show Candid Camera with Alan Funt? Everybody remembers that, don't you? I hope so. 
Does anyone remember that? There are some classic candy camera episodes, and I'll give you a couple of examples. First, a man walks into a doctor's waiting room, and he has an appointment. What he sees when he walks into the waiting room surprises him. All the other patients in the waiting room are in their underwear. Now, after a brief time of surveying the strange situation, the man slowly removes his outer garments, neatly places them next to the other patient's clothing, and then takes a seat wearing only his underwear. In another episode, the same thing was done on an elevator. A man gets on and sees that all the other passengers are facing the back wall even though there's nothing there, there's no door there or anything. He hesitates, but then he does what all the others are doing. He turns his back on the door and faces the back wall. Now, I'm not going to laugh because I've caught myself doing that on our elevator. I forget which door is going to open, so I'm always facing the wrong one. But, but uh, that, was, that was one that Alan Funt uh, portrayed on Candy Camera. Piling in. Piling in is always a great idea, isn't it? Because going along with the crowd has such a great track record of good decisions throughout history, hasn't it? Now, when Pilate asked the crowd which prisoner he should release, a convicted thief and a lifelong scoundrel or a pious rabbi who legally had done no wrong, the crowd piled into the Sanhedrin's wagon and shouted, Give us Barabbas! Jesus was crucified by a crowd piling in the bandwagon. Teaching the love of Christ by offering the unconverted the choice of Christianity or the sword was the crowd-pleasing option during the Crusades. In Puritan New England, the crowd piled into the wagons that carried condemned witches to the gallows or to the drowning pools. The crowd rarely gets it right. Piling in without thinking, praying, and soul-searching, though, is never really a good idea. You see, discipleship isn't about piling in. Discipleship is about following through and daring to be different. We fear being left behind, whereas Jesus dares his followers to be different, to dare to be better. You see, Jesus asked his disciples, what do you choose to do that's different than others? Thou shalt not pile in. The 14th commandment, if there was such a thing, goes like this. Thou shalt not pile higher and deeper, higher and deeper. A bad idea doesn't get better just because you proclaim it louder and continually repeat it, does it? The Nazis orchestrated enormous public rallies and brought crowds of hundreds of thousands to their feet, chanting, Sieg Heil. Do you know what Sieg Heil means? It means hail winning, hail winning. We have a whole culture that's yelling, Sieg Heil, and doesn't even know it, piling higher and deeper with fake priorities and phony values. We're living in a politically correct world. It used to be the church that helped you form your life values and called you to account when your actions didn't align with those values. Now, it's a faceless, faithless political correctness that tells you what to think and punishes you if you don't. Thou shalt not pile higher and deeper and finally, number 15, thou shalt not pile under. You know, people get piled under with, with too much busyness, too many expectations, too many commitments, too much stuff. We live in the fiery furnace of depression, the lion's den of loneliness, and the whale's belly of anxiety. Who among us doesn't find it virtually impossible to shake off the three old friends, depression, anxiety, and loneliness? You see, for many of us, life is a perpetual struggle to avoid the company of those old friends. Although for each of us, the friends are different. 
But arguably, the friend that shows up the most and piles us under the heaviest is anxiety. Anxiety. Now these abide. Depression, anxiety, loneliness. But the greatest of these is anxiety. You see, we're living in an age of anxiety with symptoms as diverse as anxiety attacks, anorexia, and anger. But listen to what Jesus says to you this morning. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more valuable, of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one single hour to his or her span of life? Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Do I give to you? Let your hearts not be troubled, neither let them be afraid.
Hear now the benediction. And now may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Thank you.